In this lecture, we're going to be dealing with two topics. The first is a general qualitative conceptual idea of what we mean when we talk about the concentration of a solution. And secondly, a specific unit of concentration that is certainly the most important and most often used unit of concentration, namely something called the molarity of a solution. It's been my experience that most, but not all students, seem to have at least a reasonably accurate intuitive notion of what we mean by the concentration of something. But this concept is so important to understand that I think it would be wise to spend some time on this to make certain that you have a solid, accurate understanding. When talking about solutions, there are two terms that you almost always hear. In fact, you may have been introduced to them already. They're called the solute and the solvent. Many textbooks will define them more or less like this. The solute is often said to be, quote, the substance that gets dissolved, whatever that's supposed to mean. And the solvent is the substance that, quote, does the dissolving. Now, I think texts tend to make these terms appear much more simple and unambiguous than they really are. I mean, if you take a solid like, you know, salt or sugar, and you dissolve it in a liquid, say water, there's no question that water would be considered the solvent and salt the solute, and we would think in terms of the water dissolving the salt. This is, I think, pretty unambiguous. The solid is the solute and the liquid is the solvent. But what if you were to make a solution of two liquids? Okay, let's do that. What two liquids do you think we should use? I'll bet you're thinking of alcohol and water. Well, suppose I were to make a solution mixing alcohol and water. Which liquid would be considered the solute and which would be considered the solvent? Well, some books will say that the one that you have the most of is going to be considered to be the solvent, and the one that you have less of will be the solute. That makes sense, that's fine, but I don't find that this convention is actually followed in practice. And I would argue that when you mix two liquids, you pays your money, you takes your choice, so to speak. A solution of alcohol and water could be considered a solution of alcohol, the solute, dissolved in water, the solvent, or it could be considered a solution of water, the solute, dissolved in alcohol, the solvent. You'll find that in most cases, at least in high school chemistry, any time we have what is called an aqueous solution, which means, of course, a water solution, water is almost always considered to be the solvent, even in extreme cases where there is little water and a lot of the other liquid. For example, a concentrated solution of sulfuric acid might be 98% sulfuric acid by mass, yet we still talk about it as being a solution of sulfuric acid in water, not water dissolved in sulfuric acid. It's probably not too important to worry too much about these two terms. The general practice is that when a solid is dissolved in a liquid, the solid is the solute. When two liquids are mixed, either one could be considered the solute, but in an aqueous solution, water is almost always called a solvent. And if you dissolve a gas in water, like carbon dioxide dissolved in water, then the gas is the solute and water the solvent. Since we're only going to be talking about aqueous solutions, we will always consider water to be the solvent and whatever else is dissolved in the solution to be the solute. If you've already been studying chemistry, you may know that there are actually several different units in which the concentration of a solution is expressed. We're only going to be covering the most important one, molarity. But there's also molality, mole fraction, percent by mass, percent by volume, and others. And believe it or not, chemists did not devise all these different units for the sole purpose of confusing students or making their lives more difficult. They were all designed to serve different purposes. Molarity is by far the most common and useful. But any unit of concentration, any unit that you might ever encounter, will always come down to being one of two ratios. And that's the key word, the word we need to emphasize. All concentrations are ratios, R-A-T-I-O-S. 
And it will either be a ratio of the amount of solute to the amount of solvent, or it will be a ratio of the amount of solute to the total amount of the entire solution. And there are a few things here worth discussing. You notice that the word amount is in quotation marks. And it's in quotation marks because amount is an ambiguous term. Do we mean amount by mass, grams? Do we mean an amount by moles? Do we mean an amount by volume, liters? And the sarcastic answer to that question is yes. Some units of concentration measure amounts in grams. Some units of concentration measure amounts in moles. Some units of concentration measure amounts in liters. But what all these different concentration units have in common is that they all involve a ratio of the amount of solute measured in whatever units you want to the amount of solvent. Or they involve a ratio of the amount of solute to the amount of the entire solution, not just the solvent, but both the solute and the solvent. Well, to make sure we do understand the concept of concentration, I think the key thing is to make certain that we can distinguish between two things that sound somewhat similar, but are different. These two things are an amount of something and a concentration of something. Students do occasionally get these mixed up. They think that a solution with a greater amount of solute must also have a higher concentration because, quote, it has more solute in it. And that's not necessarily true. Let's take a look at a very simple demonstration to see if we can clarify the difference between an amount of a solute and the concentration of that solute. Here we have two beakers. Since they are 250 milliliter and 1,000 milliliter beakers, respectively, as a first approximation, the large beaker contains about four times as much water as the small beaker. Now I'm going to take some vegetable dye. I'll put two drops of this dye into the large beaker to make a solution of vegetable dye. Then I'll put one drop, only one drop of vegetable dye into the small beaker. We'll stir them to make solutions. And now let's answer some relatively straightforward questions. Suppose someone came up to you and asked, which of these two beakers contains a greater amount of solute? Well, I put two drops of vegetable dye in the large beaker, but only put one, in the, one drop of vegetable dye in the small beaker. I mean, two drops is more than one. So I guess there's more vegetable dye in the large beaker. But now let's ask a different question. Which of these two solutions is more, quote, concentrated? Well, what do we mean by concentrated? We said that concentration always involves a ratio. A ratio of the amount of solute to either the amount of solvent or to the total amount of the solution. Now, in this case, it really doesn't make much difference since there were only a few drops of vegetable dye added to a relatively large amount of water. Now, which of these two solutions has the greater concentration of vegetable dye? You might argue that there is no way to tell since I didn't give you any numbers. But roughly speaking, we know that the large beaker contains about 1,000 milliliters or one liter of solution, and the small beaker contains about 250 milliliters or one fourth of a liter of solution. We said that concentration was a ratio. How might I express the concentrations of these two solutions? Well, the first solution contained two drops in one liter. So I might call this concentration, quote, two. You'll have to create a name for this unit. Name it after yourself, if you like. 
The second solution only contained one drop of vegetable dye, but that was in roughly 250 milliliters, or only 0.25 liters of solution. Well, for what I guess must be about the 8,000th time, any time you divide two numbers, you're making the denominator one. Doing the division, I don't think I need a calculator for this one, the concentration of the second solution is actually four. Even though the first solution actually contained the greater amount of vegetable dye, the concentration of the vegetable dye in the second solution should actually be greater. Now, is there any way we might really check this? Yes. Vegetable dye was used because it has some color to it. I should be able to compare the relative concentrations of these two solutions by comparing the relative intensities of their colors. It turns out it's not, quote, fair to compare colors in different size containers. So to compare these colors under uh, identical containers, let's pour them into identical containers. Hopefully you can see by making a visual comparison that the concentrations of the two solutions are different and the concentration of the solution that came from the large beaker was smaller. Even though we actually put a greater amount of solute into the larger beaker, amount and concentration are two different things. But what about the actual unit of concentration that we are going to be working with, namely molarity? Molarity has a very specific definition. It's defined as a number of moles of solute that you have per liter of solution. The symbol for molarity is capital M, and that's very important because there's a different unit of concentration that uses a lowercase m for its symbol. So always be sure to use an uppercase M when you're talking about molarity. And I'd like to call your attention to several important things about this unit. Number one, it's a ratio. It is a ratio of the moles of solute to the liters of solution. The second thing I want to emphasize is that the denominator in this ratio refers to the total volume of the entire solution, not just the volume of water. Well, what does that mean? Let's suppose you had a solution that was labeled 1.00 M molar. What does this actually mean? Well, 1.00 M would mean that there is one mole of solute for every liter of solution. But does that mean that I actually have a mole of solute and I have one liter of solution? Not necessarily. That's only the ratio. For example, I might have decided to only dissolve half a mole of solute, 0.5 moles of solute. But maybe I also decided to dissolve that in only 0.5 liters of solution. Well, half a mole of solute dissolved in half a liter of solution is equivalent to one mole of solute dissolved in one liter solution. Both represent the same concentration. If the substance were vegetable dye, both solutions would have the same color intensity. They would look the same. You may recall that in lecture number four, we talked about density. Density was also a ratio. It was the ratio of the mass of the substance divided by the volume it occupied. If I remember the numbers, we talked about one cubic centimeter of some material that had a total mass of 3.45 grams. So the density of that solid was 3.45 grams per cubic centimeter. We then imagined that we had two cubic centimeters of that material. That bigger cube would weigh 6.90 grams, but its density would still be 3.45 grams per cubic centimeter. Because 6.90 grams for two cubic centimeters is still a ratio of 3.45 grams for one cubic centimeter. Molarity is a similar kind of unit, and the two concepts 
are very similar. Well, how does one go about preparing real solutions in the laboratory? Let's suppose you're one of my student laboratory assistants. I come up to you 30 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever before class and I say to you, I've got a problem. I need you to make up the following solution very quickly. And then I ask you to prepare one liter of a 1.00 molar solution of something, let's say sucrose. So your task is to prepare one liter of a 1.00 molar solution of sucrose. In order to do this, you go and get a specialized piece of equipment called a volumetric flask. A volumetric flask has this particular shape. It's a flask whose most distinguishing characteristic is probably its long neck. If you wanted to prepare one liter of a one molar solution, you would go and get a one liter volumetric flask. As I said, volumetric flasks are specialized pieces of glassware. They measure one particular volume very accurately, but they don't measure any other volume at all. I mean, for example, a one liter volumetric flask will measure one liter with high accuracy, but that's it. It won't measure half a liter or one fourth of a liter or anything else. So if you wanted to prepare one liter of a 1.00 molar solution, here's what you'd have to do. First, you get your one liter volumetric flask. Now, let's suppose the solution you're going to prepare was sucrose, C12H22O11. Now, here's what you'd have to do. One liter of a one molar solution would actually contain one molar solid. One molar means one mole per liter, and you're making one liter, so you'll need a mole. But if you remember our lecture on the mole, we don't have any way of measuring a mole directly. I mean, we don't have mole meters in our lab. If you want to get a mole of sucrose, what you have to do is figure out its molar mass. We've done this before in previous lectures. Sucrose has a molar mass of about 342 grams per mole. You would then go and weigh out 342 grams of sucrose. In actual practice, if you were a good lab assistant, you would probably go about preparing the solution in the following manner. You'd pour a little water into the volumetric flask first. That's not a required step, but it gives the sucrose something to start dissolving in when you add it, rather than just having the solid sit at the bottom of the flask. Then you'd add the 342 grams of sucrose. You would then probably stir or swirl the solution so the sucrose would dissolve, and then you would carefully, carefully add water until its level reached a small etch mark on the long neck of the flask, which would indicate that the total volume of the solution was now one liter. You would now have prepared one liter of a solution that contained one mole of sucrose. So it would be, in fact, a 1.00 molar solution. Notice that I never said that you would add a liter of water. Sometimes students will ask, but how much water should I add? The answer is, you don't know and you don't care. Not if you're preparing a molar solution. That's because molarity is defined as a number of moles of solute per liter of solution. You don't care how much actual water was added. That number has nothing to do with molarity. You might have added 900 milliliters of water or 945 milliliters or 875 milliliters or whatever. It doesn't matter. It isn't important. All I need to know is that I will end up with one mole of sucrose dissolved in a total volume of one liter of solution. Now, suppose I came up to you a few days later and I said that I needed more of that solution for students doing the makeup lab, but there aren't that many students, so I won't need a whole liter. I only need half a liter, 500 milliliters. How would you prepare that solution? 
What you would do now is get a smaller volumetric flask, one that measures a volume of 500 milliliters or half a liter. Now, how much sucrose should you put in that solution? A mole? Since the solution is supposed to be one molar? No! Because if you were to put a whole mole of sucrose in half a liter of solution, then the concentration would not be one molar. It would be two molar. Because one mole dissolved in half a liter of solution is a ratio of two moles for one liter. And concentration is a ratio. So that would prepare a two molar solution, and that's not what you were instructed to do. You were instructed to prepare half a liter of a one molar solution. So you'd have to do a small calculation, either on paper or in the simple case, you could probably do it in your head. One liter of a one molar solution contains one mole. That means that half a liter of a one molar solution would only contain half a mole. So you would only require 0.5 moles of C12H22O11. We said that sucrose weighs 342 grams per mole. So half a mole would weigh half of 342. Again, I think we can do this in our head. That would be 171 grams of sucrose. So what my lab assistant would do would be to weigh out 171 grams of sucrose. He or she would take the 500 milliliter volumetric flask, pour a little water in it, add the 171 grams of sucrose, stir it or swirl it so it would dissolve, and then carefully add water up to the little etch mark on the neck of the flask. How much water is this? Don't know, don't care. I now have a total volume of solution of 0 0.500 liters that contains 0.5 moles of sucrose. So this would make it a one molar solution, and my lab assistant would have accomplished exactly what he or she was instructed to do. So why don't we actually prepare a solution to see how this really works? Here I have a one liter volumetric flask. And in the interest of time, we've already put quite a bit of water in it. There is an etch mark on the stem. You can't see it, but it's right here. When I add water to this etch mark, I will have measured a total volume of one liter quite accurately. We're not going to use a substance like sucrose. I mean, 342 grams or even 171 grams is quite a lot, and it might get a kind of messy. Rather, we're going to do something a bit simpler. We'll use vegetable dye. Now, we're going to pretend that four drops of vegetable dye equals one mole of vegetable dye. Instead of weighing the vegetable dye, we'll just pretend that four drops equals one mole. Let's suppose I wanted to prepare one liter of a one molar solution of vegetable dye. Well, we know that one liter of a one molar solution would actually require one mole of solute. So I need one mole of vegetable dye, and we've arbitrarily decided that there are four drops of vegetable dye for one mole. So let's put four drops of vegetable dye into the water. I now have one mole of vegetable dye in the solution. I can swirl it to get it all mixed. But it isn't one molar because I don't have a total volume of one liter. So what I need to do now is carefully add water until I fill the volumetric flask to the one liter mark. Well, you know, if you're actually doing this in a lab, if you were a lab assistant, you would be sure that the etch mark was at eye level and for accuracy, you'd probably use an eyedropper to add the last little bit of water. For our purposes, I mean, we don't need to spend time making it all that accurate. So I will add water until presumably
I now have filled the volumetric flask. There it is, exactly to the etch mark, right on the button. And now I have, in fact, prepared one liter of a one molar solution. But what about preparing the half liter of this one molar solution for the makeup lab? How would you do that? Well, in order to do this, you obtain a 500 milliliter or half liter volumetric flask. The volumetric flask you see now measures 0.5 liters. It has an etch mark right here on its neck. So now how would you prepare a half liter of this one molar solution of this vegetable dye? Well, you'd have to do that calculation, usually on paper for real lab work. In this simple case, we can probably again do it in our head. One molar means one mole per liter, but I don't have a liter. I only have half a liter. So I'm only going to need half a mole. But how much vegetable dye would that be? Well, let's go back to our arbitrary decision. If four drops of vegetable dye is one mole, then I think we can do this one in our head. Then to get our half mole of vegetable dye, we'd only need two drops. So if you actually wanted to prepare half a liter of this one molar solution, you would literally put two drops of vegetable dye into the volumetric flask. You would swirl it, of course. And then you would add just enough water to prepare a total volume of half a liter solution. Again, with incredible scientific accuracy, we will be right on the money here. Look at that, perfect. Now let's see if we understood that by posing another question. You know, I just thought of something. I just said something really stupid. Let's see if we understand that. I don't know why teachers say that. I know I do that a lot and probably won't be able to stop, so just humor me, okay? Let's suppose as a lab assistant, you were instructed to do the following. Some of my student lab assistants were exceptionally good. A few of them helped me out for three or four years. They got so good that all I had to do was tell them what I needed. With no further directions being necessary, they knew exactly what to do without any help. This time you are asked to prepare 250 milliliters of a 6.00 molar solution of vegetable dye. How would you actually do that? Well, 6.0 molar means that you have six moles of vegetable dye for every liter of solution. But you weren't going to prepare one liter of solution. You were just going to prepare 0.25 liters of solution. So you are going to need six moles per liter times 0.25 liters, or a total of one and a half moles of vegetable dye. Since we said that four drops of vegetable dye was equal to one mole of vegetable dye, if you need one and a half moles of vegetable dye, then you're going to need 1.5 times four, or a total of six drops of vegetable dye. So what you would do would be the following. You would take six drops of vegetable dye and add it to the 0.25 liter volumetric flask. Six drops would be one and a half moles. You then would add water, just enough water, don't care how much that actually is, until we filled the 250 milliliter volumetric flask to the etch mark on its neck. This would produce a total volume of 250 milliliters or 0.25 liters. I now would have one and a half moles of vegetable dye dissolved in a total volume of 0.25 liters, which would indeed be a six molar solution. You would have accomplished what I asked you to do, and I would be very, very grateful. This lecture was designed to make you thoroughly understand the concept of concentration and what molarity is all about. But obviously, in working real molarity problems, we don't deal in drops and nice whole numbers. So in the next lecture, we're going to see what real molarity problems look like and how they can be solved.